Okay, let me start again because I just started the recording. <laughs> so welcome everybody to our uh, new series of uh, Bootstrap Seminars that uh, opens the new uh, year, 2021. And I'm sorry, there was a confusion about the link. We are now using a new link, Zoom link uh, for the uh, new year. Uh, and we are very glad to have Alessandro Vicky uh, start the new series. He'll tell us about the good, the bad, and the unstable. And as always, if you have questions, just unmute yourself and go ahead and ask. Thank you very much. And thanks for the invitation. It's a pleasure to start this series of seminars. And um, so I will uh, tell you about uh, the work that we completed the last year in November with uh, these gentlemen, which is basically a, a numerical bootstrap study of uh, the stability properties of the O3 model in three dimensions and related models. So you will see who's the bad, who's the good, and who's the unstable, hopefully. Um, so I, as I understand when uh, it's common practice when there is a huge collaboration to show picture of, of people. And so it would have been nice to have nice picture of us like they used to do in the, oops, sorry, how they used to do in the past, uh, this very fancy and, uh, and, and nice Solve conference. But unfortunately due to the pandemic, uh, we couldn't uh, gather all together in a single place. But fortunately or unfortunately for us, uh, Jun Yu has uh, a lot of artistic friends, so he had us drawn in a, <laughs> in a very serious and, and professionate way uh, in, this, uh, in, in this picture, where I let you guess who's who, but I can tell you that I'm, uh, I'm the, the guy sitting on the tree, I'm the storyteller, which is why I'm giving the seminar today. So let me get to uh, some motivations. Um, so why do we want to do this study and uh, what do we gain from it? Uh, so the O3 model as uh, other OM models, it's very important in the study of critical phenomena and phase transitions. In particular, the O3 model describes the phase transition of, from uh, the paramagnetic to ferromagnetic phase uh, in, uh, in, in fer ferromagnet. Uh, it describes also the transition between antiferromagnetic uh, behavior and paramagnetic behavior in at the, at the Neil transition. Uh, uh, and those all, all, all these materials are listed in the table in the left. Okay. And uh, this is taken from the very nice review uh, of uh, Feliceto and Vicari. And, uh, but the author model also describes other kind of phenomena. For instance, if you have uh, Mag magnets with some temperature perturbation, which is a disorder uh, in a quench way. Um, this, this, this perturbation turns out to be irrelevant. That's the case for any ON model with N larger than two, so except the Ising model. And so uh, basically, if you add this perturbation, you go back to the original model. So also this kind of, of phase transition are driven by, the, are described by the O3 model in the infrared. Um, of course, perfect isotropic uh, magnets do not exist in nature. Uh, in fact, at the molecular level, you have all sorts of anisotropies, in particular, if you are uh, on a cubic, uh, on a cubic uh, lattice, um, you, you will have, well, not only on cubic lattice, but I will restrict myself to cubic lattices. And in, on these lattices, you have interaction with the crystal field, that my, can be zero or non-zero depending on the material. Uh, for instance, in this, uh, these materials that I listed, the, for the first two, the interaction with the crystal field at leading order is zero. So uh, the effect of the anisotropy is smaller than in other cases. Uh, but there are other sort of, of anisotropies, for instance, dipole-dipole magnetic interaction between spins. There is this, uh, this term which is called exchange interaction uh, between the spins. So there are all sorts of anisotropies that can be described, that were described back in the 70s and the fifth, end of the 50s uh, for, for all sorts of materials, especially uh, these ferrites. And, uh, and they can and basically they break the, the, the isotropy of the, of the magnets uh, so that down to a smaller symmetry group. Um, so depending on whether on how important these, uh, these effects are, we will have uh, different behaviors in the infrared. 
Um, so for, in particular, for a lattice, for a cubic lattice, these anisotropies, uh, they, they do break the O3 o o symmetry, but they preserve the, uh, the cubic symmetry, which is a subgroup. So if, uh, if you want to write a model, a uh, lattice model that, is, that describes this, uh, this phase transitions, well, the, the first thing that you would write is the usual term, which is uh, the ON invariant uh, um, spin spin interaction among nearest neighbors. And then to this, uh, to this interaction, you would add um, a term which is localized at each site and you're summing over the sites. And uh, uh, so the, the smallest interaction you can write that preserves the cubic symmetries is the sum of quartic, uh, qu quartic spin elements, uh, uh, sum over, over the, the direction and sum over the sides. So this term is, uh, is called crystal field term and uh, it breaks the one, the one symmetry. So if you go to a continuum limit, or if you're interested in describing a quantum field theory that has the same uh, universe in the same universality class, you would write Lagrangian like the one that I reported, where you have the usual ON Lagrangian plus uh, this cubic interaction, which is a sum of uh, phi i, where phi i is a vector uh, in the, it would be vector in the in ON notation. So you're summing each element to the fourth power and then you're summing over the element. So, uh, and then you would like to study uh, the, the phase space of, of this model in order to understand what kind of infrared behavior uh, you could expect. In particular, it's very easy to understand what's going on in, in four minus epsilon. Uh, here you have two couplings. So there will be, there could be, and there will be different um, critical points generically. So there is, of course, the Gaussian where everything is zero, which is uh, unstable. Well, I'll, I'll tell you more about stability properties in the next slide. And there is the, the, the couple Ising model where you have n copies. Here I generalized to, to n uh, to spin with n components. So when u is uh, the coupling u is equal to zero, of course, the Lagrangian is simply a decoupled sum of Lagrangians, Ising like. And so you have n copies of the Ising model. Then you also have the, the Wilson Fisher uh, with ON symmetry, where you basically set to zero the, the cubic interaction. And then there is the, the famous, indeed, uh, hypercubic model, where both couplings are non zero and uh, there is no uh, enhanced symmetry. So the, the question that we would like to answer and that has been asked for for decades uh, in, this, in, this, uh, in this kind of context is what are the stability properties of this fixed point among each other? And it turns out that this is, uh, and the answer depends on, on the number of components that you have. So in particular, we will see that there is a, a critical value of N uh, for which the behavior changes. So just to summarize, well, just, just to go through all of them, the Gaussian, uh, is always uh, unstable uh, because uh, because quartic interactions are always stable are always relevant in, in dimensions smaller than four. Um, the the couple easing model is also always unstable, and this is simple to see because uh, how do you couple uh, various copies of the of the Ising model? Well, you just add a perturbation, which is uh, the product of uh, the epsilon operator, the singlet. In the, in the in in each copy, um, so uh, and, and this object turns out to be relevant because the dimension of epsilon in uh, in three uh, in three dimension is one point four something, so twice of that is more than two. So it it remains to to ask uh, wh what about the ON model versus the hyper hypercubic model. So to answer to this question, uh, one can realize that um, the quartic, the cubic term that we add to the Lagrangian, to the ON Lagrangian, can be written as a, combi a, com a linear combination of two operators in ON notation. ON notation. Uh, one operator is the sum component of the traceless symmetric uh, rank four tensor this, that I called T4. And another component, another 
part of this linear combination is given by the second singlet uh, in, ON, uh, in the ON model, which we know is irrelevant because uh, the ON model is critical and not multi-critical. So it only has one singlet, a relevant singlet. So the, 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 the second term can be forgotten, but the first one, um, it's, it's, um, it's unclear whether, well, it's not known a priori where, uh, if it's relevant or irrelevant. In particular, as I said, it, it depends on n. So for n equal two, there is a simple argument that tells you that uh, this object should be irrelevant. And the argument is very simple. Uh, in, in, uh, in n, when, when n is equal to two, because of you have very few uh, components, you can basically rotate, uh, you can do a field redefinition and uh, um, basically map um, a Lagrangian where both couplings are zero to a Lagrangian where only the V coupling, sorry, the, um, the V coupling is zero. So you can rotate away U as long as V is, is non zero. So basically, the, the decoupled Ising is uh, equivalent to the cubic. And since the decoupled Ising is unstable, the same would be for the cubic. And indeed, we know that this, uh, this charge four operator, in the case of n equal to just a charge, uh, has dimension 3.11. This is from Monte Carlo. Can I ask a question about this point? Sure. So, uh, so I know, of course, the, the standard uh, Lagrangian argument for, for why decoupled Ising and the cubic fixed point should be the same. Right. Uh, so, but th th since that is a Lagrangian argument, I would say, okay, that's kind of a perturbative argument. Is there a non-perturbative way to argue that in D equal three, there is no, that, that this equivalent still holds down to D equal three? Um, Well, besides knowing exactly the dimension of T4, uh, let's see. Um, like, is there some symmetry reason, for example, that cubic group is not is somehow with n equal two is not sufficiently rich? And is there some argument of this kind or not? Well, I guess yes. I, I get. Well, the thing is. Um, So the, the Z, uh, the cubic group is uh, Z2 squared times. Uh, it's just a dihedral group of eight elements. The symmetry should right. be for n equal two. And there's no symmetry reason why it shouldn't be. Exactly. So for, for by symmetry, you cannot say that. Okay. Um, but I think you can argue that basically as you, as you move, um, as you, as you move in epsilon, the, the spectrum changes continuous. I mean, it's, uh, it's a purely Lagrangian statement at this, place, at this level, as far as I know. Okay. Thanks. Very much like uh, equation of motions are Lagrangian state. Um, okay. So, so for n equal two, we know uh, delta four is is irrelevant. For large n, we know that the, the dimension should be around two plus one over a correction because this object can be built, it's built out of four fields, and and phi goes to one half. So at some point there should be a transition. So people have studied how this, uh, this when and how this transition happens in, in, in Paris way, in particular with epsilon expansion, you can do, you can compute uh, the critical N defined as the, the value of N where um, the cubic theory becomes unstable. So there, it has one additional relevant uh, singlet and, uh, and this, so you, you compute order by order in epsilon, then you do a parallel summation and you get some number, which is 2.89 with a very small error. But of course, this is the error of, of parallel summation. So it has to be taken with, uh, with the usual covers, but it seemed pretty, pretty solid. Um, you can also do Monte Carlo, simula Monte Carlo simulation in the ON theory directly and try to estimate the dimension of t delta T4 or you can do epsilon expansion in uh, in N or in um, in ON model and compute the dimension of this operator directly. So this has been done as well, and uh, all the determination again with the er error bars that comes out of uh, comes either from Monte Carlo or from epsilon expansion resum or uh, D equal three expansion resum. So uh, again, it's always always had the they always have this the usual problem of, uh, of uncertainties. 
So they all agree that this operator should be uh, relevant in, uh, in, in three dimensions, meaning that NC is larger, than, it, it's, it's more than three. And so at this point, we, we, we come with a bootstrap and we want to give a precise statement about this. And uh, okay, here at, at slide six, I'm going to give up my biggest selling point. Uh, so the result that we get is again in the, well, of course there was no doubt, but we, we managed to prove, the important thing is not the result, but that we managed to do it. Uh, we, we obtain a rigorous upper bound on the dimension of the spin four guy, um, which is consistent with the, all the other the determination uh, that, that had been done before. So um, this, the relevance of this operator has an additional consequence that I would like to, to review briefly. Um, one can discuss the stability of the ON model also not only to cubic perturbation, but to another set of theories that are these uh, uh, biconal or, or decoupled uh, th theories, fixed points. So uh, basically you start from a theory, which is, which is uh, uh, ON1 times ON2 invariant, which has this Lagrangian. So you have, a you have an order parameter for both, um, for both groups. Phi one is charged under ON one in the vector is a vector of ON one and phi two is a vector of ON two. And uh, this, I will call it capital N their sum. And then you couple this, this, uh, these two theories with uh, this H perturbation. And again, you can do a, a four minus epsilon analysis of this theory and you discover that there are many fixed points. Of course, there is always the Gaussian. There are the single uh, with some Fisher or little n models uh, when, when only one of the, of the G coupling is non zero. There is a, a decoupled uh, fixed point where both G couplings are non zero, but H is still zero, so that theories don't talk. And fi finally, there is an, a, an enhanced uh, Wilson Fisher ON model where all the coupling are, are non zero, but they are related in a specific way. So such that they, they basically recreate the, the square uh, of, uh, of phi square. And finally, there is a third, uh, there is a, an additional six, uh, sixth um, fixed point, which is called biconal, where all the three couples are non-zero, but there is, there is no, uh, they are not related and there is no symmetry enhancement. And so the question is wh how they are, which one is stable and which, and which one is unstable. And uh, you can do an analysis um, based on, on evidences from Monte Carlo, from the bootstrap. And uh, you, can, well, you, you, sh you can show that the auto model is always stable with respect to the other two. Um, for n equal four, so for n larger than four, whatever combination you take for n1 and n2, uh, the decoupled Ising model, sorry, the decoupled with some Fisher uh, is stable. Uh, and this you can prove basically by, by looking at the, the epsilon, the dimension of epsilon in, in the various combination on one or on two. For n equal four, there is a, there is a question of uh, stability uh, of the O4 of, of or biconal. Uh, we don't know which one is stable or which one with respect to the other. And for the relevant case, uh, which is n equal three, uh, you can, well, it's, it's simple to say, it's uh, very easy to show that the, the couple with some fissure is unstable and we'll come back to this at the very end. And again, the uh, stability of, um, of the O3 with respect to the, the couple um, is, is uh, determined by the dimension of, the, of this um, quartic, sorry, this uh, rank four traceless symmetric operator. So again, if, since we managed to prove that this object is relevant, um, it means that the O3 model is also unstable with respect to the biconal. So among all this class of fixed point, the biconal is the stable one for n equal three. Um, okay, so, so this, this, okay, I already gave you the answer, but this gave us the um, concrete bootstrap question, which is to prove indeed that the delta T4 is smaller than three in the O3 model. And to do that, uh, one has to 
consider correlation function so to do a bootstrap analysis or at least a rank two uh, traceless symmetric tensor so that you, you have access in their OPE to this to this representation. Well, alternatively, one could have uh, one could study um, the property, the spectrum of the cubic model, and there has been uh, um, studies on this by by Andy and by Ning and uh, and uh, Junchen. Um, but, uh, of course, this is very complicated because uh, and and there are no well, there is also a work in progress by Andy. Um, and, and other people that I don't know. Uh, but it's very complicated because uh, if you start with this, uh, with this with the smaller symmetry, you always, you always have the higher the higher symmetry theory that uh, contaminates your, your bound. So you have to come up with clever assumptions in order to disentangle these theories. And so there haven't been uh, uh, explicit result in this in this direction yet. And also, it's important to notice that this, this theory that I've been discussing for n equal three, they are very close. Uh, and this is expected because the dimension of, of the operator that drives, uh, that starts the RG flow, it's very close to marginality, which means that the RG flow will be very short. And in fact, ha there has been estimated estimates uh, from, uh, this is, these are from epsilon, epsilon expansion resumed uh, of the difference uh, of, uh, of the um, critical exponents, both the eta and nu, which are related to the dimension of, of the order parameter phi and, 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 and s, the, the, leading, the smallest singlet. And you see there that the difference, it's order phi, uh, 10 to the minus four or, or 10 to the minus three in the best case. So the, these theories are very, are very close. So it will be, it, will, it is very hard to distinguish them. So our strategy was indeed to uh, start from the O3 model and try to study this uh, this operator uh, with four uh, indices. And then the vanilla thing that you would try to do is to start from a single correlator of uh, of the tra of the two rank two traceless symmetric uh, tensor, uh, spin the, the, the Tij, and try to put to put a bound on delta T4. So these uh, these uh, dashed lines. Uh, the intersection of the dashed line is where you is the point that you would like to exclude, and but well, you see that we are we have well, the, the vanilla bounds are very are very far away, even if you if you assume well these are with the uh, uh, rather um, conservative assumptions, but nevertheless if you try to put more gaps if you try to put uh, increase the numerics. You, 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 we don't. We didn't manage to to get closer to this point. So it's important to do something more involved. On the other hand, uh, we, as you as you all know, uh, if you start by if you start bootstrapping uh, other operators like the fundamental and the singlet, uh, we managed in the past to to put uh, to create uh, islands in this in the in the, the in the plane of delta s delta epsilon. Which were converging towards the Monte Carlo. So this this was, uh, of course, at the time, uh, this determination was still um, a bit away from the desired procedure precision. Uh, but nevertheless, it gave us the, the idea that at least in this, uh, if one includes this operator together with the spin two, uh, one is, one is able to um, constrain the the theory inside a small region where the spectrum is sort of sort of rigidly uh, constrained in a certain way, and perhaps uh, this this constrained spectrum, the rigidity of the spectrum inside the island, would uh, translate into a better determination of delta T four. So one, so what we did was to put everything together. The, what was done in the past and what uh, was unsuc unsuccessful. Uh, for 42, in a, in a mixed system of with three external operators, phi, the, the back to the fundamental representation, the singlet, and the rank two. By the way, these are the smallest dimension operator, the scale, scalar dimension operator in the theory. So this is also the smartest thing to do because as we know, bootstrap bound get worse as you increase the dimension of the external operator. 
So I will not, I will not uh, indulge too much in details, um, just to give you some numbers. Uh, there are 28 crossing equations, which means that there are also 28 OP coefficient, uh, product of OP coefficients that, uh, that appear in these in, in, in this OP, in this OPEs. Um, we have to scan over three external dimensions. So this is already a complication. You have three, three uh, dimensions to fix. And we have seen in the past that um, once, well, well for, for, first of all, we, we know certain, um, uh, we know certain information uh, about the theory, for instance, we, the number of relevant operators. So we will, we, we input this, uh, this assumption. And in doing so, we isolate certain operators. So there are, there are operators that stick out, uh, that they, they don't live in the bulk, they are isolated from the rest. And so once you have that, uh, we have seen in the past that it's important to scan also over the OP coefficients of those, of the, of the, of those isolated operators. And in this case, there are five such OP coefficients. So if you take ratios, there are four angles. So we have three, dimen three external dimension, four angles to scan. And on top of this, we would like uh, an, a bound on delta T4. So this is a very complicated problem. And it was only possible to tackle this problem thanks to the development uh, in the, both in the, in, in the efficiency of uh, SDPB uh, pushed by, by Walter and David, and also thanks to the algorithms that have been developed last year uh, by this collaboration. So, uh, which I will review in, 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 in a while, well, briefly. But so let's put for, for a second on hold the, the bound on T4 and let's, um, let's focus on, on the three external dimension. So using the, all the machinery that we developed, we managed to find uh, such a very small island, which is much, much smaller than the one that, we, that, we, uh, that I showed you before. Uh, and actually we were very proud of ourselves because we were beating Monte Carlo badly, but then couple of months before we published, uh, Hasenbusch published also an, up, an update on, on Monte Carlo, shrinking incredibly the Monte Carlo, Monte Carlo determination. So at the end of the day, we are, we are even. We perhaps we gain, we, we lose something in certain direction, but we definitely uh, gain something, something in other direction. So um, the two determination are, are very con are consistent among themselves, which is very, which is very nice. And, um, and show the power of the, of the two methods. But so far, uh, so just to clarify, this result does not, does not assume any, cons any aggressive bound on delta T4, okay? So all that we used uh, to, to get this, this result are conservative assumptions, like uh, the number of relevant operators when we know for sure uh, how many there are, and Small gaps far away from the from the from the region of where some operator is expected in other channels. Um, but now, on top of this, we would like to um, we would like to determine an upper bound on delta T four. So one I, one I think that one could do what uh, would be could be to uh, walk around in, in this allowed region and uh, compute the extremal, the extremal spectrum, perhaps minimizing or maximizing certain quantity and read off the dimension of, of, of T4. This definitely would give um, a, a, an estimate, reliable estimate of, of delta T4, but is not precise enough, first of all, and is not rigorous. So we had to do better. And to do better, we had to basically scan, well, literally scan over the, 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 this gap. So the idea is to think about delta T4 as, a, as another direction, as another direction in this uh, high, high, high dimensional space. So the three dimensional island that was computed basically at a certain small gap in, in this higher dimensional space become a, becomes a peninsula. Okay? It's, a, it's a elongated region that ends at some point when you reach the maximum gap. 
And so the strategy is to map out this, this peninsula and determine the upper bound on delta T4. So just to show you uh, a snapshot of the calculation, this is what, what, what becomes. Uh, so the projection here are two external dimensions that have been reshaped in order to have a, a more spherical region. And the vertical direction is uh, delta T4 minus three. And so you see what was an island in, in, in external dimension space, X and Y, becomes an, a, a peninsula. And then you want to find the tip of this, of this peninsula. So um, just to give, give you a sense of, of the difficulties here, um, you, you cannot bisect directly, blindly in, 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 the, in the gap, simply because, OK, you have an island at certain gap. Then you try another gap. And perhaps you don't find anything. How do you know if you have missed uh, a, a very a very tiny spike, or, or or instead this this value of the gap is really disallowed? You don't know that. So in order to do that, you really have to 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 map the shape and follow the shape and and really check where it closes. So to do that, we have to develop another algorithm. Can I, can I, can I ask a question at this point? Sure. Uh, why couldn't you, for example, uh, uh, do something like that? Uh, put some value of delta T4 where you think, which you think is going to be excluded eventually, mm -hmm. and then start increasing gradually the number of derivatives. And then you will see that your island will be shrinking gradually, and then you will see that after some sufficiently high number of derivatives, it will disappear, and that would be probably rather robust is there something yes it, it, well okay uh, first of all it's not the most efficient thing you can do okay and, and second of all it's very very complicated to um which event which eventually boils down to the same problem that problem that i described it's very complicated to understand uh if um so one of the main problems in this setup is to find allowed points at the next uh, and max. When, when you get to the to very, very high end max, the region gets really close, really small. And so it's, it's very difficult to, to understand if you, are, if you really have excluded everything or if you really, or, or if you're missing something because you don't, you don't, you don't have enough precision. Okay. So it's the same problem as before, basically. So okay. you really have to follow, uh, um, and, and since and max, you cannot, you cannot change it uh, smoothly. Uh, you have to fix and max and do the other thing. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, I think I'm coming. Okay. And just to to tell you, this um, this, this uh, the tip of this of this uh, this region is really flat. So it, it's also a problem there to to zoom in to zoom in and determine precisely uh, the, the the shape. It's really really flat. Um, perhaps you cannot appreciate from this picture. Okay. So uh, as I, because I don't, I don't need to explain anything about the bootstrap to this community, I can spend a couple of, couple of minutes uh, to describe essential tools or things that we have developed and that I strongly recommend for the future uh, bootstrap studies. Okay, this is a bit of propaganda. Well, the first one, uh, which comes basically for free, can be, can be done in any bootstrap study, is hot starting. So uh, basically what it means, it means that you can recycle uh, a computation that you have done at a certain value of dimensions and, and OP coefficient in a neighbor point. So dif different values of, of, uh, of deltas close by or different OP coefficients. So for instance, this is a picture made by Ning uh, for the Isin model. Uh, so what you're doing, you are hot starting. So you're using so you're comp you are testing the, the points where the, the black cross is. That's what, you're cro that's what you're testing. And to do these tests, uh, we are using um, the, the, the functional basically obtain the functional or eventually the solution of crossing obtained in the neighbor's point, in the green and red points. And so usually uh, if you start from scratch, uh, this would take sort of something like 80 iterations, but if you use uh, a neighbor point to start, it will it will take from one to eight 
or 10-ish at most uh, iterations. So it basically already this buys you uh, a factor of 10, one order of magnitude in, in, in speed, which is, which is very good. So this is uh, very efficient. Um, so this is one thing. Another thing that uh, we developed in the, in the, for the previous paper on O2 was this cutting surface algorithm. And I would like to briefly remind you, remind you because it's very, it's very convenient. It's very important. So the idea here is that whenever you scan an OP coefficient, because, because this, op this operator is isolated and so you want to, to scan over the OP coefficient perhaps, um, you, you, one, one should re realize that uh, the functional or that, that excludes a given point normally excludes a whole region, an extended region nearby. And so by patching together these allowed regions at some point by uh, after a finite number of patchwork, uh, you basically it can exclude everything. So this is explained. This is uh, exemplified in this in this um, in this picture in this figure. Basically, we start from this sphere in the upper uh, left corner, which represents the space of OP coefficient after rescaling. Um, and then you test the, the blue point and then and perhaps you find it disallowed. Okay, so your computation not only excludes this, this point, but it excludes a whole, basically a whole half sphere uh, on the left of this, uh, of this point, which becomes in the, in the subsequent uh, figure, it becomes the red point. And then you test another point in the bulk of the remain region, the blue point. And then again, you, you, if, if you find it disallowed, you exclude a whole chunk of, of, of the region. And so you go on and basically all the times that you do this, you cut the allowed region by half. And so eventually after a finite number of steps, either in this case, in, in this case you, find, uh, you, you find an allowed point, which is the, the blue point in the final, in the bottom right corner. Um, or you cover everything and you exclude everything. So after a finite number of, of iterations, you, you, you are able either to find solution of crossing or to rule out this particular point. And so you declare that this point is disallowed, not only in OP space, but also as a point in dimensions. So basically this uh, by finite number of steps, after a finite number of steps, you have, you have solved the problem of scanning over OP coefficients. So since the OP coefficient usually are many and increase a lot your, the, the dimensionality of your space, this, this uh, algorithm is also very important. Can I ask a question about this point, Alessandro? Sure. So uh, why, what is the status of trying to apply this idea also to scans over dimensions? Um, well, this basically goes back to the to the previous of starting thing. Um, no, but, but is, for starting, you use it differently. You don't say, right. "Okay, I have the functional." Well, okay. First of all, here, here you could say, "Okay, I excluded some point in the dimension space, so certainly it excludes also some portion of the volume of the dimension space." Right. So in somehow that case, there, this doesn't work as well because there, here, this dimension seems to be very big, but there, the dimension seems to be sometimes very small. So what's the, the, there, is the, also, there is also the issue that as you change the external dimension, you change the the conformal block, so you have to recompute everything. So you, you cannot do it. You can still try to use the same functional on the new conformal blocks, but it's not going to work very well. Right, you can do it on, on you can do it on the on the new conformal blocks, which is what I was showing before. But you have to do it point by point. There is no, uh, there is well, we didn't think it too much, but I don't think there is a a, a, a smooth way of doing of, of taking into account the dependence on on the conformal block dimensions um, in a single shot. Okay. I mean, Sorry. You, but is it is it hot starting as you said exactly that i mean if the functional works for your neighboring point right right uh, starting does exactly that but you have to do it point by point no, uh, so, 
No, I'm sorry. Hot starting means take from this function, start from this function, and then run as DPB. Right. Well, here we are not running as DPB again. We're just taking this function and just seeing what other space it excludes already. So it's a bit better than hot starting. It's it's way better than hot starting, but but um, uh, uh, well, what I think Bart was meaning is that uh, when you hot start and you just do one iteration, it's basically like the function of excludes already that point. Okay. Uh, yeah, exactly. But, uh, it wouldn't even need an iteration, I guess, if, if, yeah. if it would exclude a nearby point. But I also understand your your argument, Alessandro, where you say that uh, this is I mean, this is it's working with entire regions and not point. Right. Yeah. So it's it's hard to keep into account the dimension of, of the conformal blocks in in a in an analytic form, if you want. But for example, I could imagine that perhaps there is some way to correct the function a little bit so that it will work also at nearby points better like maybe the, exactly the same functional doesn't work but maybe you just twist it a little bit and correct some coefficients it and then be, it, will work. Um, it could be um i i personally haven't thought about this i'm not sure if perhaps ning in one of these experimentations has um but yeah it's definitely something to think to think about because eventually we would like to consider more and more operator dimensions and uh, and this will become an issue in fact, the, my next slide is to how to determine how to officially sample this the higher dimensional space of the, um, um, which are the, the external dimension operators. And so usually when you do a vanilla bound uh, on, on operator dimension, you just do bisection, but in higher dimension, this becomes uh, very expensive and not efficient at all. So better things are uh, triangulations where you basically triangulate uh, points and then you bisect in the line that connects uh, one allowed and a disallowed region uh, point, um, and this works pretty 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 nicely in two and three dimensions. And but for the specific problem we had uh, at hand, um, we want, what we wanted to do was to start from an allowed region and then basically find a bound on an extra an extra quantity within this region. And to do that, we developed this, uh, this, this new algorithm, which is called tip top, uh, which basically finds the top of, finds the tip um, of the peninsula. And uh, it basically, well, just to say it in words, I don't want to enter in the details unless uh, some, someone is curious. Uh, so you start from, uh, from uh, some gap. Well, first of all, you, you need a guess of a maximal gap where everything is ex excluded. And then you start uh, at the gap below it. And then, uh, okay, you explore this and you have an island perhaps. Uh, then what, what TipTop does, uh, it reshapes this island in a more convenient form so that everything is smooth and it's more spherical. And then when you do that, uh, basic, most likely the points that you have computed are not evenly distributed. So what uh, TipTop does, it populates uh, the, the rescaled region in a, in a way such that the boundaries of the region are, are well understood. And then uh, the next, uh, it has a, a, a built-in um, very smart way of deciding what's the next uh, gap to explore. Uh, so, yes. So what TipTop does, uh, the, 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 the algorithm, what the algorithm does is decide how, what to sample next. And then eventually you, you just go in, uh, not in bisection, but in, in iterations back and forth until you reach a certain tolerance. And by doing this, you have mapped, as I was telling you, we have mapped the boundary of this, uh, of this region um, very precisely, and you're sure that you're not missing uh, uh, features. And I should say that we use it for three dimensions plus one gap but it can, it can be used also for other n plus one uh, analysis, but it has to be decided at the beginning. Okay, so uh, just to summarize what, what I, I said so far, and um, so we, we obtained- but, uh, like, Can you say some words? What do, what do you mean by then you are sure? Is it because you understood how precisely this island was shrinking? What exactly gives yeah. you the certainty? Exactly. Well, of course, there is always the, the issue that, I mean, there is the assumption that the, the region is, is sufficiently smooth, there are not spikes uh, starting randomly here and there. 
but but uh, you have you have precisely understood the shape and you have followed it to the end. Okay, so you, as, so as long as you assume that this some sort of manifold, smooth manifold in n plus one dimensions where n yes. was, then you kind of understand. Okay. Yes. Thanks. So okay, so what I was saying, um, just to sum up. Uh, we obtain this bound on, on delta T4 in an O3 model, which is found to be relevant in agreement with previous determination. And this um, makes the O3 model unstable to cubic perturbation and to the beacon of fixed point. So this basically tells you that the magnets that we find in nature are not described by the O3 model, but by the cubic model. Um, so we also introduced this, uh, this tip top and previously this cutting surface algorithm that are very suitable for, uh, for high, large scale bootstrap studies, but can also be applied to smaller scale. And uh, I think it's now time to move beyond the ON model and, uh, and, and do something more, more ambitious like uh, QED or super QED in four dimensions or non-abelian currents and, and stuff like that. And uh, also, um, and I, I will, I will want to say something about this. Um, also, with this, uh, with this new determination, we, the determination of this T four is also comes with uh, a lot of of, of uh, CFT data. Of course, we have rigorous bounds on external dimensions, but we also have uh, estimates, very precise estimates of the of the OP coefficient, and also quite precise estimate of the, of the spectrum uh, appearing in these, OP, in these OPEs that we will release at some point, uh, perhaps with some uh, light, uh, light con uh, bootstrap study. Um, so it was a nice coincidence that today uh, there were two papers on the, on, on the archive uh, on numerical bootstrap. So it, I swear it was not done on purpose, but I, I couldn't help myself then. I, from advertising, um, both of them. One is by myself and Andrea, and another one very nice by uh, uh, Ning, Jun Chen, and Hin Chen. Um, and they are both basically on similar things, although they they analyze uh, this, uh, this problem from different angles. In our case, we bootstrap, we do a, a, a systematic bootstrap study of uh, adjoint scalars in two dimensions, and in doing so, we, are, we discover new families of kings, uh, which are promising. Uh, one of them in particular looks like, could be related to uh, bosonic QED in three dimensions. And we also find some evidences of uh, phase transition that have been predicted on the lattice. One of them is, uh, uh, is the ferromagnetic CP2, and the other one is the antiferromagnetic CP3. And, and the nice thing is that those models are sort of, they, they kind of escape the usual landau Gidsburg paradigm. So it's, it's nice if you, can, if you can narrow down them. Uh, so we did some preliminary study in this direction. And instead, the, the, the other paper is more general, uh, more general uh, has more general arguments on how you, uh, you can use the, um, the knowledge, well, how you can, sorry, uh, they, they, they have a very interesting idea about how to distinguish um, the underlying gauge theories in a bootstrap study. Normally, we say that uh, the bootstrap is not sensi sensitive to the gauge group because we only analyze uh, local gauge invariant operators, but this is not quite true because depending on the gauge theory and the underlying gauge theory, you might be able to construct or not construct certain operators. So in particular, they identify certain class of operators that, uh, that are naturally heavy in, uh, in abelian gauge theories, but they, are, they can be smaller. More, they can have small dimension in, in, abelian, in non abelian gauge theories. So you can use this to distinguish the two. And they also, basically, they also relate to the family of kings that we found. And, um, and then they also explore the role of, of um, equation of motions in, uh, in gauge theories. And they use this information to bootstrap QED in two plus epsilon dimensions, and they found islands. So uh, it's a very nice result. Um, finally, I, if I have five, five more minutes, I would like to uh, conclude with a, sorry, 
sort of puzzle slash future direction. So now that we have uh, all this, this, uh, this information, all this data from the bootstrap, it, would, it, it, is, it is time, it is nice. Well, it opens the, the way to study, to do conformal perturbation theory around these, uh, these CFTs and explore the neighbor, but also the RG flow from one fixed point to another. So in particular, one example could be to study the flow from the O3 model to the cubic, since we have discovered that this mod, this, uh, the O3 model is unstable. So here I'm quoting a couple of, of um, formulas from the nice paper by David and Zohar, where they reviewed conformal perturbation theory and, and they give formulas in terms of, for the beta function and the anomalous dimension of an operator in terms of the CFT data at first order. Uh, when you perturb your theory with an operator O, which is almost marginal. So in the case of, of the O3 going to cubic, this operator would be uh, the, the rank four traceless symmetric tensor, which has dimension very close to three. So the, the expansion parameter is this little delta, which is one, one, uh, 0.01. So unfortunately, in order to do, to make progresses, you would need, uh, you need to know the, the, the coupling at the fixed point, which is proportional to the three-point function of T4, 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 which we don't know yet. So we cannot make much, much progresses. On the other hand, if you look at the formulas, you will see that uh, the dimension of this object at the new fixed point, uh, it's independent, at least at leading order, from this, uh, from this quantity, it cancels out. Uh, also because basically it's the, <clears throat> So, um, uh, and so you can estimate at living order in Delta that the dimension of, of the cubic will be 3.01, which is kind of expected uh, to be slightly marginal. Another example that, that I would like to propose and can be actually done in more details right now with the data we have at disposal is uh, the flow between the decoupled Ising times O2 model going to the beacon out, because we have seen that the, the O3 is inst unstable and the beacon is stable. So what you're flowing to is, is the beacon out theory. And uh, in this case, as I was telling you before, uh, the decouple is unstable because the, the, there is this deformation, which is the product of the epsilon uh, operators in the Ising model and the auto model, um, which is relevant. And, but, but again, it's almost marginal. So one can, can do this, uh, we can carry on this, this program. And uh, okay, the mentions of, of operators that are purely Ising or purely, purely O2, that gets corrected at order delta square, the leading, the leading order correction is zero. So here, in order to get those, you have to compute four point function. So this is slightly harder. Um, and that can be done because we, we do have we do have all the data, uh, well, part of the data. Um, on the other hand, there are operators that can be already computed. For instance, this one, which is the product of, of, the, order, of the two order parameters of Ising and, and O2. And this should map to an operator in the Beaconal, which is sort of the TIJ in the O3. Now, if you remember before, I told you that the O3 and the Beaconal, they are very close, especially in the, in the, in the critical exponents eta and, and nu. So one would expect that this, the dimension of this object should be very close to the one of, of, of T, of Tij in the O3 model, which is 1.2, but instead you, you find 1.12. So here, either the far perturbation theory at, at leading order is, uh, is, not re is not sufficient and you need to go to, to next leading order because perhaps delta is, is not small enough. Uh, or perhaps this, this operator gets a sizable anomalous dimension, sizable meaning not 10 to the minus four. And similarly, you can do a uh, product where you can, you can compute the dimension of the operator that started the RG flow and you get something like 3.07. So it could be nice to test this prediction, perhaps by bootstrapping the beaconal theory or check perhaps with a, 
it's by computing the, by estimating at least the higher order correction if uh, conformal perturbation theory is reliable for, for uh, a deformation of this side. Okay. I think I'm done with, with time. So I thank you for the attention. And uh, if there are questions, please. Alessandro, sorry, I missed the, the, the puzzle. So I didn't see a, a real puzzle. Well, the puzzle is, is uh, uh, the puzzle is that you would expect if the theory, the Biconal and the O3 model are very close because they're connected by an operator which is very almost marginal, you would expect that all operators are very close to each other. Okay, there, there is a there is a, a multiplexer combination in one case, but the, the almost dimension should be almost the same. Is that here? No, no, no. I understand, but I simply I didn't get it as a puzzle. I mean, it's just a mathematical okay. factor which is a slightly larger than what you expect. I mean, I don't. Uh, okay, anyhow. So, well, I, okay. okay. I, call, I call it a puzzle. Perhaps it's not a puzzle. It's just a fact. Hi, hi, Alessandro. I I have sure. a, a question which I think I asked already several times whenever you guys show me these islands. So I yes. think I think what you showed is uh, is for fixed n max, right? For a fixed value of n max, you analyze the shape of this. the maximal. Yes. So, but uh, did you study how it changes with uh, with n max with uh, the I mean the yes. number of derivatives? Yes. We 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 studied and it, it's actually very important in order to guess uh, the starting point of the next n max. So in order to guess where the allowed region will be at a given n max, you what we did was you start from a smaller n max and then you 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 extrapolate the, the shrinking behavior. So that's how we guess. The, the, and the, do you think uh, at n max equals infinity, the island shrinks to a point? Uh, I don't know in the sense that, well, I think we, we, we tried some extrapolation, but it's uh, in order to extrapolate, you would need very precise data. And we don't have that yet. I mean, the, the, the island is three dimensional, so it, to map it carefully in, uh, but uh, let's see. Yeah, I mean, this question also applies to the Ising. Oh, sure. sure. The Ising does not seem to shrink to, an, to a point. Um, I see. But, uh, well, for instance, the, 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 two, the, 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 two, the two, the mixed Phi's S definitely did, did not shrink. This one with three external operator has better uh, asymptotic behavior in the sense that this low, the shrinking ra rate is, is higher. Uh, but with the data we have, it's inconclusive right now. But it's definitely much way better than before. Okay, sorry, but this is already something I didn't know. So in the other islands, you already have clear evidence that it saturates, that the size. Well, the, the clear point. evidence. The clear evidence comes from from four points. <laughs> but okay. uh, but yes, we we had uh, the 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 trend was that. Uh, pushing to n max uh, to a higher n max would not have uh, gained us too much, that, which is why we didn't do it at the time. Thanks, thanks, Alison. Anyway, actually, if it doesn't shrink to a point, then it opens uh, it opens a possibility for a problem. Which otherwise would look very, very difficult, but maybe if it doesn't shrink to a point, it's not as difficult. Which is to show that somewhere within this island, there is actually an exact solution to crossing. Um, you know, because we, we work with this island and it's always like sometimes people object, but how do you know that this island somehow, if you increase in max, somehow it doesn't disappear? Maybe it doesn't disappear, then then this safety doesn't even exist. But if you kind of numerically see that the island seems to stabilize, then somewhere inside there has to be an exact solution to crossing, actually many exact solutions to crossing. And one could imagine that, uh, one could argue that, 
but could argue that the solution exists, you know, somehow mathematically. Well, it's a job for a mathematician, maybe, but not for a physicist, but, but it becomes a feasible problem, feasible looking problem, just as a common. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I mean, the, the definition of a, of a CFT is that you, you need to, to impose crossing on all correlation function, right? So yeah, that's, yeah, that's too the ambitious. Fact but... that you, the fact that you can narrow it down uh, with only a finite number it would come as a surprise to me. Um, no, but you see, in physics, there are some uh, often there are this we are doing these finite computations, but we, sometimes we are not sure that okay, for example, you compute the gap of some system and you computed it on a on a spin chain of length hundred, but and you see something finite, but then you go to one more point and then it just mm -hmm. gap shrinks to zero. So, so uh, sometimes people. I'm happy to just show, okay, there are these equations, we study them numerically, but if I really want it, there is some, maybe some iterative procedure which could start from your numerical approximate solution and then by method of iterations converge to some exact solution. One could imagine that something like that is possible. Um, As a matter of principle. Yeah, um, well, at the moment, we, we don't have evidence of either, either thing, either way. Uh, I mean, it, it, we don't have enough data, precision in the data to extrapolate and, and say, definitely that's going to happen, that, that's what's going to happen. Um, my impression is that the more operators you include, the, um, the more you're sensitive to stuff and, um, and also, there, there is the problem that of, of like finite precision and um, you know mm -hmm. spectrum at the high dimension at high dimensions. Uh, there are all sort of problems. So it would be it would be very surprised that you could prove that uh, with three with three operators you can shrink your point. But definitely improves a lot. Can you estimate the size of n max of which the island saturates stop shrinking? Um, so, yeah, in in the previous in the previous analysis, with two with two. Well, that 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 depends on the fit, right? Um, so what what we observed is that um, with, with two with two external operators only, what we observe is that a linear fit, which sometimes works in in these bootstrap, bootstrap studies. Was not giving um, a well, a well, def well, it was not giving the proper, proper behavior. So, in particular, uh, already at n max 18, uh, which is lambda 35, uh, things would deviate uh, from the from the linear behavior. Um, but this, I mean, it's, it's very simple. You you can see it by eye also. Um, then, in this case, we we haven't we haven't really push this, uh, this analysis in the Is there evidence for the opposite? So that if I have, let's assume that I have a solution to crossing, that it's in, that there are some condition under which it's impossible to deform. Let's say I I, I, uh, I I take a parameter a small parameter lambda and I deform all the scaling dimension and the opaque coefficients by lambda. Is there any any an analytic analysis that says okay uh, there are it's 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 uh, it can be impossible to deform a solution to crossing? Yes, I would say that if you don't have an exact marginal operator, right? Right. right. So in supersymmetry you can do that, but without supersymmetry. But but the uh, sorry, but how do I think Marco is asking what's the proof of that? It's a belief, but is there a proof? But there was this paper by by Connor, right? Uh, discussing certain uh, conditions in order to have uh, a conformal manifold. No, no, no. I think you, you're misinterpreting his paper. Oh, his paper is exactly if there is a marginal deformation, then okay. you can deform. If there is no marginal deformation, then we don't know how to deform. Right. But there's no proof that we can't. That's what Marco is asking. Sure, there is sure. a proof that you cannot. No, no, there is no proof. So, sorry, Marco, I, I understand. Yeah, sure. 
there's no problem. In fact, we, we have counter examples for non-local theories we can deform even in the absence of an exactly marginal operator. But then you have to add operators to the theory. Uh, no, not necessarily. Take a generalized uh, free field. It's a one parameter fend the solution. Ah, okay, sure. With one correlator, yes, but with 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 the several, if you in a situation when we have an island like for the easing, there you would have new primaries appearing yeah. in the situation. Mm -hmm. Are there any further questions? I maybe have a comment that uh, I just want to say that that's really an amazing uh, feat in precision. I think it's like a milestone. We've been dreaming for so long that one day this is going to be done. Well, now it's done. I think you guys should be proud of this. It's really amazing that you could do it. Yeah, no, it, it was a, it was a, it was an impressive effort, and, and it was it was possible thanks to the to the collaboration. Particular thanks to Walter and uh, and all the discussion we had. You know, so. Glad to hear. Anything else? If not, so do we have a scheduled seminar for next week already, or no? Yeah, we do. There's going to be a talk by uh, Peter Turkin uh, about his recent paper with. Uh, with uh, Sasha Zhiboyedov on um, on exact uh, two to two scattering amplitudes with particle with non-zero particle production. That's great. So we'll see you next week. Thank you, Alessandro. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.